I want to speak to you today on the subject of what does the Bible say about Israel, war, and final prophecy. And I want to begin reading out of Psalm 122, and it's nine verses long. Let's read the entire psalm. The Bible tells us, I was glad when they said to me, reading out of the New Living Translation, let us go to the house of the Lord, and now here we are, standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. Pause right there. As a student of eschatology and Bible prophecy, one of the things, if you're taking notes, that you need to write down and always remember is that all of Bible prophecy revolves around Israel, and Israel revolves around Jerusalem. When you listen to many modern preachers and teachers, especially in social media, you would think that Bible prophecy revolved around Washington, D.C., and the Democrats and the Republicans. But that is a tremendous error if you're a serious student of the Bible. Do not ever forget that Bible prophecy revolves around Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is not only the capital of Israel, but after the rapture and after the tribulation, God will so exalt Jerusalem that she will become the entire capital of the entire world. And the Bible here is in the 122nd Psalm putting that bright light on Jerusalem. Verse 3, Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord as the law requires of Israel. Here stand the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. In light of what's gone on this weekend, perhaps if you have not already run a highlighter through that in your Bible. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace for the sake of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. As we turn our attention to the events that are currently, even as I'm speaking, evolving in Jerusalem and Israel and the Middle East, I want to lay down as a bedrock for where we're about to travel. The most important thing this morning is not that you understand all of the high points of the chronology of end time events and final Bible prophecy, although I'm going to do my best to walk through that in this message. But I want to make abundantly clear at the infancy of this message and then at the end of this message the most important thing is that you're living ready to meet the Lord. There are people who are incredible students of the Bible, and they have devoted themselves to an intellectual ascent to biblical facts and Bible prophecy, but they're not living ready to meet the Lord. Of what value is an intellectual ascent to the precepts of the Bible if you're not living in right relationship with God. And most of you who know me know that I've dedicated almost five decades of my life to missions and world evangelism with one purpose, to help men and women and boys and girls make peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But if there ever were a time that you needed to take a hard look at who you are, and who you are in Christ, and how you're living in light of eternity, I would strongly advise you that you had better get serious about making sure all of your accounts with God are paid in full. 
And so when I'm done, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Those that are here live in this sanctuary, those that are watching through various social media formats and around the world, and you never know anymore. The church that I was just at in Wasilla a year ago, a message that I preached there, over 1.4 million people have listened to that message, not on my YouTube channel, on their church's YouTube channel. The last time that I preached here, you never know. Uh, Several hundred thousands of people are listening even though we're here. It's a different day and age. We live in a day and an age where you can hold a microphone in your hand and cameras will cause that message to go to the ends of the earth. And so wherever you are listening from, I want you to have a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I am going to cover some information and some background details that I think are vitally important for Christians to understand in this time. But if you don't get anything else, make sure that you get, how do I make peace with God? And you make peace with God according to the Bible by doing three things. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. There has to be a time in your life when you in humility go to God in prayer and say, Father, I know that I have sinned. I know that I have made mistakes. I know that I have violated your commandments. I recognize my sin. B, you also have to not only recognize your sin, you have to be willing to repent of your sin. And notice that I didn't say able. You're not able to repent of your sin by your own strength and by your own disciplines. Repentance simply means a willingness to turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Jesus Christ. And thirdly, you have to receive Jesus Christ. There is no way to having a right relationship with God but through faith in Jesus Christ. It's oftentimes called the essential doctrine of the Bible. Faith in Christ alone is the only way that you can obtain the forgiveness of sins and the sure knowledge that whatever happens in this world, that you'll be ready to meet the Lord. And so as we enter into this message today and talk about what does the Bible say about Israel, war, and final prophecy, I want you to begin to prepare your heart for the invitation that I'll give in the moments to come. And I'd like to have the privilege when I'm done of meeting you here at this altar and personally and publicly praying with me what many people call a sinner's prayer. Those of you that are online, I want you to prepare your heart to pray as well. And today can be an eternal changing moment for you. How many want to live every day ready to meet the Lord? Let's take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, we never open up the Bible without a keen awareness of how dependent we are upon you in all of our ways. Everything we have, everything we ever hope to be, we owe it all to you. And so I humble my heart, not only before these people, but in your holy presence. And I ask you to strengthen mind, body, and spirit and quicken me by the Holy Spirit to share the truth of your eternal word. We are most certainly living in the final moments of human history and the perilous times that Bible prophecy warned us about surround us We look to you for our strength. Through the Bible, you have given us the wisdom and the counsel of heaven on how to navigate perilous times and to walk in victory every day. My prayer is that not one person who hears me preach will be absent in eternity's morning, but I pray that through the preaching of the word today that you'll open their ears, open their eyes, and open their heart to the message of salvation and living ready to meet the Lord. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. 
And all God's people said, Amen. During a major Jewish holiday, early Saturday morning, Israel was struck by an unprecedented early morning surprise attack by a group called Hamas. Air raid sirens began sounding in Jerusalem at about 8.15 in the morning local time, warning the citizens of this unexpected attack. Quite frankly, Israel was caught unprepared. A nation that is usually on high alert at all times was caught in a weakened moment. And a stunned Israel tried to quickly mobilize their forces to defend and retaliate, immediately launching strikes into Gaza. Throughout the day, Hamas claimed that they had launched over 5,000 rockets into their targeted areas. Can you imagine? The entire statehood of Israel is smaller than the state of Connecticut. Imagine 5,000 rockets in a short amount of time. Not only were rockets fired, but borders were compromised, train forces strategically streaming in. They were coming in by hang gliders, and an invasion like has never hit Israel in decades has been on the news, and many people are obviously concerned. In a televised address on Saturday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who earlier had declared, quote, Israel is at war, end quote. That's quite a statement in and of itself. That in and of itself should be a major alarm clock, whether you're a Christian or an unbeliever. When the prime minister of Israel declares, we officially declare we are at war with the military prowess that Israel has, global leaders are wide awake. He went on to say that they will use their military strength to destroy Hamas capabilities and take revenge for this black day, end of quote. And then he warned, quote, this war will take time and it will be extremely difficult, end quote. So for all who think this is just a blip on the weekend radar of news, I think we need to pay attention to what the prime minister's intent is. He said, we are at war, we will retaliate, we are going to exact justice like never before, and we are committed to a long-term war. Israeli media, citing rescue service officials, said, and I'm sure this number is already inaccurate, but as of my last setting to document, 250 plus people have already been killed 1,500 wounded, making it the deadliest attack in Israel in decades. Hamas fighters also took an unknown number of civilians and soldiers into captivity in Gaza and will no doubt use them to heighten the terror and the fear. They have already posted, they've been on my digital documents, probably yours as well, the videos of horrific scenes of those that have been taken captive, some already tortured and murdered and put into social media. But as Christians living in the West, which is where I stand speaking today, how do we make sense of what could be the beginning of a major Middle East and regional conflict? Because I have preached and taught the Bible long enough to know that the average person really doesn't understand the complexities of Israel and the historic Middle East conflict. So if you're taking notes, if you'll allow me just a moment to lay what I believe to be a very important foundation to your understanding of Israel, the Middle East, and even Bible prophecy. Number one, five words that Christians should understand concerning modern Israel. 
Because I'm sure that many of you, if we were to sit down and chat, some of you would have perhaps a cursory knowledge. Some would have absolutely no knowledge. Some in the West don't care. As long as the bomb doesn't land in your backyard, you're impervious to anything that goes on. But if you're a believer, the Bible has commanded you to be an ally of Israel and Jerusalem in your thoughts, in your prayers, in your giving, and in your heart of concern and compassion. It is impossible to be a serious student of the Bible and a dedicated believer without understanding your responsibilities and your spiritual responsibilities to Israel, to Jerusalem, and to God's chosen people. Can I hear a good New England amen? Number one, five words that Christians should understand concerning modern Israel. Now, these are obviously going to be brief. Feel free to go back and do more in-depth study. I cannot do an exhaustive study on all of these in the time that we have. Number one, Hamas. That's the group taking full responsibility for this heinous attack. Hamas is an aggressive, fundamentalist, militant movement and one of Palestine's territory's two major political parties. Word number two, Fada. Fada, formerly known as the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, is a Palestinian nationalist and social democratic political party. They are the counterpart of Hamas. Word number three, Palestine. Although the concept of Palestine uh, regionally and its geographical extent has been fluid throughout modern history and ancient history, in the Middle East as I speak, Israel and Palestine, don't miss this, share the land west of the Jordan River. Very important that you understand that if you're going to understand at least the geopolitical nature of this conflict. Palestine and Israel share the same land west of the Jordan River, using the word share lightly. Israel is predominantly a Jewish state, while Gaza and the West Bank are Palestinian and mostly Muslims and Arabs. So you can imagine just in that sentence the powder keg of having a small territory with multiple political groups and agendas, two of which exist to exterminate every Jew from the face of the planet, to have all of that in a small area occupying the same land, borders of which they do not even agree on. Number four, West Bank. People hear that all the time in the news. I've been to this part of the world, and so I have the advantage of the visual and the geography of actually being there and studying it, obviously, for four decades. The West Bank is one of two Palestinian territories. Don't forget that. There are two Palestinian territories, and they don't share the same borders. The West Bank is located within the country of Israel, and it is the larger of the two territories at approximately 2,173 square miles. The West Bank stretches across the eastern border of Israel and along the west banks of the Jordan River and most of the Dead Sea, which is why it has received the name the West Bank. The holy city of Jerusalem, is considered by international law as part of the West Bank, with East Jerusalem being claimed as the capital by both the Israelis and the Palestinians. So throw that complexity into what we've already discovered. They both claim Jerusalem as their capital. Number five, Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is the second and smaller of the two Palestinian 
territories. And it's on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It borders Egypt on the southwest for about 11 kilometers and Israel on the east and north for about 51 kilometers. Both the West Bank and Gaza Strip were captured by Israel in the Six-Day War of 1967. There are over 5 million Palestinians combined living in those two territories. Muslims comprise 85% of the population of the West Bank and 99% of the population of the Gaza Strip. So there, in a very brief nutshell, is an overview of five words that you'll hear continually, have heard continually on the news when we deal with Middle East complexities and now war. If you as a Christian are going to understand what is going on, take time to rewind this teaching and go over those five words, fill in the blanks with your own study, but at least digest those five words and phrases and territories because until you understand that, you're not going to understand the detail of Bible prophecy in this area. Number two, what is Hamas fighting for? Why all of a sudden this unprecedented aggression? The Hamas group's charter calls for establishing an Islamic Palestinian state in place of Israel. Hamas does not even recognize Israel as a legitimate government. And in their charter, Islamics are committed to a word you do know, jihad, which is simply a holy war, and they want to take Palestine from the Jews and eliminate not only the state of Israel, they are committed to wiping every Jew off of the face of the earth. This is not just a Middle East problem. If you pay attention to any of the United Nations summits and the leaders that come from that part of the world, they stand on the floor of the United Nations here in the United States of America and scream with the necks bulging with veins, hatred on their face, swearing that they will eliminate not only Jews, but eliminate us in the West. Islamic Jihad is not a joke, and it is becoming more aggressive in the last years of my life than I have ever seen it. And what is more frightening for some is that they now have access to incredible military strength and weaponry that they've never had before. I remember much of my life watching these same players in the Middle East standing on the other side of fences throwing bricks and stones and handguns and pistols, but they now have the backing of nations like Iran and Turkey, which is another thing time will not permit me to preach on, but it is beyond grotesque, I'm trying to be graceful. It is beyond imagination that our current administration is sending untold millions of dollars to Iran, knowing that Iran is sharing that with Turkey and arming Hamas and much of it being directed at the elimination of the statehood of Israel. It is anti-Semitism in a demonic level, and our nation has blood on its hands. And the Bible said, I'll bless those that bless Israel, and I'll curse those that curse Israel. If you think this conflict does not have impact and potential consequence upon our nation, you are living off grid with your head in the sand. Number three, does this newest war in Israel relate to Bible prophecy? This is the most frequent question that is coming in through my private messages and emails into the ministry. Not exactly word for word, but basically that sums up what I'm being asked. Many of my pastor friends have called in the last 24 hours and 
we've chatted and tried to have conversations. Many of them are trying to process exactly what's going on and how serious this is. But if you're taking notes on behalf of this message, number three, does this newest war, and again the word war in and of itself carries weight, does this newest war in Israel relate to Bible prophecy? Perhaps the most grandiose of questions on the minds of Christians and Westerners. In my four decades of ministry, and in your life as well, I have witnessed that every time there is a conflict in the Middle East or around Israel, people quickly panic and fearfully proclaim, this must be the end. And social media lights up with what is oftentimes called clickbait. But this has escalated things perhaps to a different level that I've seen in maybe all of my ministry. People are genuinely wondering, is this Bible prophecy? Is this the beginning of the end? Is it this conflict that is going to call for some charismatic world leader to step forward and a meeting that perhaps could take place in Jerusalem where the signing of the peace treaty that begins the tribulation period could be in the near future? These are the things that students of the Scripture are concerned about. The problem with placing unwarranted emphasis upon every Middle East conflict is that we as Christians can become desensitized to legitimate prophetic teaching. The proverbial crying of wolf, wolf, many times in the church, desensitizes believers in the West to the bigger picture of accurately what the Bible said, and what will come to pass. Secondly, we can also foster a spirit of distrust among unbelievers and unchurched people concerning the believability of Bible prophecy if every time there's a hiccup in the Middle East, we have believers and spiritual leaders and denominational leaders crying, wolf, wolf, this is the end. And so that is not the proper approach for responsible believers. What is always the responsible approach is what does the Bible say? Not our opinions, not what are the denominational dogmas that are being woven through the geopolitical concerns, but what does the Bible say? Turn to Matthew chapter 24 and let's read the words of Jesus on this matter. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, Jesus said, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Pause right there. Run a highlighter through that. The substantial believer should never panic in end-time prophecy, no matter how bad things get. Because if you are living in true salvation you are equally living in true security. Because ultimately, the worst thing that can happen is they can attack the temporary, but they cannot touch the eternal. I'm going to live forever. And no matter what happens to my body on this earth, I have the hope of a resurrection and a body that will one day be transformed from mortality to immortality. Jesus taught us in another passage, never fear those who have the ability to attack the physical body, but fear those who have the ability to cast your soul into hell. Well, I have good news for you. No one can cast your soul into hell but you. No one has the ability or the authority or the spiritual prowess to make your decision as to where you stand with God. That, my friend, is a personal decision. And in just a few moments, I'm going to challenge many of you to make that commitment. And many of you need to secure that commitment or come back home. Post-pandemic, over 45% have wandered away from the church 
It's time to come home. Jesus is about to return. And we need to live every day ready for that soon return. This is not the time for you to feud on Facebook and social media about what you like or dislike about the church or pastors or religion or religiosity. This is a time for intelligent people to get right with God and to live ready for the soon return of our promised Messiah. You will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Did you hear the words of Jesus? Wars and rumors of wars do not result in immediate prophetic events. Let me read on. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom, There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of birth pains with more to come. So when we properly interpret the prophetic words of Christ in context regarding wars and rumors of wars, the first thing we learn, it is one of many signposts. It is not the signpost. It is not the end. It is not a reason for panic. It is one of multiple signposts that let us know we are getting closer to the soon return of the Lord. And Jesus interestingly uses the term birth pains. Birth pains, I hate to trigger anybody, but only women, (laughs) only women fully understand birth pains. Now, you may have a cousin or an uncle who feels that he has a right to give such information about his hope that one day he will. All I can tell you is that in thousands and thousands of years of archaeology, They have only uncovered the bones of males and females and not a single other gender. So I know I'll open a can of worms in being so brave as to say this, but only women fully understand the depth of the words of Jesus when he used the phrase translated birth pains. But I am a father and a grandfather, and I've read a book or two. And what we all understand about birth pains is that they increase in number and they increase in intensity. I want you to visualize that as if you were listening to Jesus personally, because through the Bible, he does personally speak to us. How many of you know the Bible is the written voice of God? So wars and rumors of wars, including what is going on in the Middle East, is not the end. It is a signpost of how close we're getting to the end. Wars increasing in number and intensity are a prophetic sign given to us by Jesus Christ that something significant is coming. And so to look at the war that has been declared in the last hours in Israel, which is significant, I'm not in any way trying to underplay that. I am trying to put an exclamation point that we don't panic when stuff like this happens, nor do we declare crying wolf, wolf to an unbelieving, skeptical world that this is the end. It is not. It is the alarm clocks that are going off letting you know that the significant appointment draws very close. Can I hear a good New England amen? Amen. Conflict in the Middle East, I mean, if you're a student of history, the reality is whenever Israel has existed as a nation, whether it was the Egyptians or the 
Amalekites or the Midianites or the Moabites or the Ammonites or the Amorites or the Philistines or the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians or the Romans, the nation of Israel historically since existence has always been persecuted because Satan hates the prophetic agenda of God. And God's prophetic promise revolves around the Jewish people, not the Americans. I've preached this for 40 years. I must offer caution continuously. Be very suspicious of talking heads and ministries on social media who put an emphasis upon Bible prophecy and tying it into America. Because America is nowhere to be found in Bible prophecy. And anybody who is trying to push America into the pages of Bible prophecy is going to have to go through an incredible amount of theological gymnastics and poor hermeneutics, and I'm again trying to be gracious, to put America in Bible prophecy. America is suspiciously absent in Bible prophecy, and I believe the Bible is clear as to why. I'll come back to that. So thus what we see in the Middle East today may merely, merely be just one in a long series of wars and rumors of wars. I've already covered that but let me flip that over and give you equal biblical truth. Because on the other side of that is I realize that when the prime minister declared war, as a student of Bible prophecy, I know that there is the war of Gog and Magog prophesied by Ezekiel in the 38th and 39th chapter and I know that by Bible prophecy knowledge that the war of Gog and Magog, the Bible's not dogmatic as to the exact time of it. I have never been dogmatic in my 40 years of preaching on it. But most scholars agree the battle of Gog and Magog will either take place just prior to the rapture or perhaps be initiated before the rapture and take place just after the rapture. Now, I've already preached on that. I believe that message is on this church's YouTube channel, and it for sure is on mine. I don't have time to preach on Gog and Magog, but I just need to quickly say this. In the Bible, Gog is a man, and Magog is a land. Gog is a man, Magog is a land. The Bible's very clear on that. Where many believers get confused is there are two Gog and Magog wars in final Bible prophecy, one of which is coming up very soon on the chronology of Bible prophecy. As I just mentioned, most likely it will occur before the rapture or just after the rapture or could be initiated before the rapture and be in full-blown effect after the rapture, we can't be dogmatic. That war of Ezekiel 38 and 39 involves Russia. The Bible's very clear on that. Rosh, the land to the extreme north of Israel. Moscow is about 1,200 plus miles, about four degrees east of Jerusalem, straight north. There is no other land that can be negotiated in Bible prophecy that war, one of the leads, will be Russia. The truth is we have no idea how Russia could be involved in what went on this weekend because Hamas receives their training, their military strategy, and their weaponry from Iran, from Turkey, and from Russia. And sadly, Americans have been sending billions of dollars on a regular basis that has been filtered through all of those venues. It is sad and grotesque to think that the American taxpayer may be funding the Gog-Magog war that could be just around the corner. And again, 
Don't walk out of here and say that I said that dogmatically. I'm just saying I know enough about Bible prophecy to know that America is suspiciously absent, and there's a reason why. I'll bless those that bless Israel. I'll curse those that curse Israel. Don't forget there's a second Gog and Magog war. That occurs at the end of the millennium and is totally separate. I don't have time to preach and teach on the two Gog and Magog wars. If you don't already subscribe to our YouTube channel, just subscribe and hit the notification bell and there's fresh content every week we spend a lot of time preaching and teaching on the chronology of Bible prophecy and end time events. You need to listen to those two teachings on Gog and Magog when you have an opportunity. Lastly, and I close with this, number five, what is the most important thing for Christians to remember? Because I believe when you preach the Scriptures and teach the Scriptures, that you should carefully lay a foundation that even children can understand. But I think it needs to at some point be summed up with practical application. And at the Bible College in teaching the students, one of the things that I have always strongly taught is that preaching should be more than diagnosis. It must always include remedy. And too much preaching today is a diagnosis, a statement of fact, a statement of opinion, a statement of political agenda, all kinds of diagnosis with way too much human DNA. But Bible preaching should be diagnosis with biblical remedy. And I close with this fifth question if you're taking notes. What is the most important thing for Christians to remember? The greatest war against Israel is taught in the Bible, and it's called Armageddon. But the greatest war against Israel, and again, the war before Armageddon is the Gog-Magog war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Again, Russia will be a leader in that. China will be involved with that. And a coalition of nations, mostly Islamic and Muslim, will be involved in that coalition. And the Bible, if you're an individual who's skeptical about Bible prophecy, let me throw this out to you. Did you know that in that Gog and Magog war, the Bible tells us that the Euphrates River in the Middle East will dry up? and that this coalition army will actually use the riverbed of the Euphrates River as a military highway to access that region that they'll attack coming out of the north. The three great rivers of the Middle East, the Euphrates River, the Tigris River, and the Nile, guess which river in recent months has been drying up? The Euphrates River in recent months has been drying up to the point that you could literally bring a military coalition down its riverbed and fulfill exactly what the Bible prophesied. The Bible is so accurate. It is history written before it takes place. And for those who might be listening to the Scripture and you think that the Bible's fairy tale and a crutch for the weak-minded, the Bible, above all secular books, above all sacred books, There are thousands upon thousands of untold religions in the world, most of which have what they call sacred books and sacred writings. But what separates Christianity from all other world religions is the Bible stands above all other sacred writings as it is filled with prophetic content. No other religion, no other religious writing has prophetic content, but the Bible is 27% prophecy, and over 80% of those prophecies have already come to pass with complete and total accuracy. That gives you an intellectual reason to believe that if God has already completely and to the detail dotted every I, crossed every T of every prophecy up until now, it gives me good reason to believe he's not going to miss the events that are soon to come. 
You don't need to have raw faith alone to come to Christ. The Bible is provable intellectually through records of history, through biblical archaeology, through manuscript evidence, through prophetic content, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, etc. There are many legitimate and intellectual ways of proving the content of the Bible. But here's my advice to you. If you're a doubter, if you come from the lineage of doubting Thomas and you doubt everything, I can't believe the Bible is just a book written by men. Every book is written by men. What a shocker, the commonality of books. They don't rain from the sky and bind themselves and run over to Walmart and jump on the bookshelf. <laughs> All books have been written by men and women. But the Bible was written by holy men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the proof of the Bible is that in all of the pages of the 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, 27% in prophetic content, not one contradiction, not one lie, not one untruth. Everything in the Bible is not only believable, it is provable. And what is not provable stands upon the foundation of what is. My advice to you is even if you're a doubting Thomas, get right with God and continue to wrestle through your questions as a Christian. You can do that, you know, it's an option. Coming to Christ doesn't mean that you have to leave your scholarship and your mind on the altar. Your scholarship and your mental capacity should increase as a believer, not decrease. James tells us in the New Testament, if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And so if you're an individual that is skeptical by nature, a doubting Thomas by nature, prove it to me by nature, give your heart to Christ and continue to wrestle with your intellectual questions, but wrestle those intellectual questions Questions within the shadow of the cross, knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed your heart and prepared you. And one day what you don't understand on this side of glory will be fully understood on that side of glory. Come on and somebody shout a vigorous amen. I close with this. The Gog-Magog war potentially could be connected to what we've seen happen in the last 24 hours. Again, don't leave here and dogmatically say Tiff Shuttlesworth said that this is the beginning of the Gog-Magog war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in my 40 plus years of studying Bible prophecy and almost every scholar of reputation, they all agree that the Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog and Magog War, which, by the way, in a nutshell, if you've never heard of it, Ezekiel in the 38th and 39th chapter said that in the last moments of human history that an aggressive leader from Rosh, which is Russia, will have a lust in his heart to revive the what we would call the Russian Empire, believing by that reunification of the Russian Empire and other allied nations that he can go and assault Israel and take over that land along with its wealth. That, in a nutshell, is the Gog-Magog War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I can tell you that in the world of eschatology, it lights up blog columns concerning is Vladimir Putin, the Gog of Ezekiel 38 and 39. I'm not saying that he is, but I'm not saying that he isn't. All I know is that's the next major war in the calendar of God's chronology is the Gog-Magog war. Again, when will it happen? Either prior to the rapture or just after the rapture or potentially if what's going on in Israel this weekend is the forerunner to that and the stage is being set, 
we may be on this earth as believers long enough to identify that surely must be the Gog-Magog war. That is a possibility. But again, I'm not being dogmatic. I'm just being biblical. But what I am going to be dogmatic about is this. The next major prophetic event on the calendar of God is an event called the rapture of the church. Let me again tell you, the great war of Israel is when? The greatest war against Israel is Armageddon at the end of the seven years of tribulation. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up. You were wondering what I was talking about moments ago and where that is found in the Scripture, Revelation 16. The great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings of the east, China, could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And no, that is not referring to the ladies on The View. Lord, I apologize, and I don't know where that came from. I ask you to forgive me. I sense it coming from down in this area right here. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all of the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me. Are you watching for the soon return of the Lord? Those who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all of the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. So as we close, don't forget this overview of chronology in Bible prophecy. The Gog-Magog war is probably the next major war that will be on planet Earth. It will occur potentially before the rapture, perhaps after the rapture, or maybe in full swing when the rapture takes place. But the battle of Armageddon, the greatest war against Israel, does not take place until the end of the tribulation. If you're a new student of the Bible, the tribulation period is found in the book of Revelation, beginning at chapter 6 and ending in chapter 19. And it ends with the second coming of Christ returning with the armies of the Lord. We read about that in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. There the Bible said, Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, And his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God. The Almighty like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. The rapture of the church is the next major prophetic event on the calendar of God. And immediately after the rapture is the beginning of the tribulation period that the Bible is detailed seven years exactly. And not by our calendar, but by the Hebraic calendar of 360 days. So the Antichrist cannot be revealed and the tribulation cannot begin 
And these final wars of prophecy will not be fully released until the power that restrains them is removed. That's good news. Can I hear an amen? And the Bible talks about that restraining power on earth in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 through 8. You know what is holding him back, the Bible said, speaking of the Antichrist, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Paul writing to that brand new group of Christians in Thessalonica tells them that these end time events and the revelation of the Antichrist, that one world leader who will cause a one world government with a one world monetary system, a one world religion and a one world military power to police and enforce the severe and barbaric mandates the Bible said he cannot be revealed. The final events of the tribulation cannot take place until something that is restraining the evil and the wickedness in this world is removed. Since the restrainer is holding back the promotion of the Antichrist, we know that the restrainer has greater power and greater authority than the Antichrist and the global world order. Since the restrainer steps out of the way, the restrainer has to be removable. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, and he said, don't you realize that all of you together, speaking to believers, all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you. The true church is not a building. The true church is not a denomination. The true church is not a man-made organization. The true church is spirit-filled believers who have put their faith in Christ and are living ready for his soon return. The corporate church is the most prolific force in the world that the Holy Spirit uses both in word and in deed, we are restraining the full release of wickedness and evil that is in the world. If you think things are bad now, wait until the rapture takes place. Imagine what the world will be like when the Spirit-filled church and all believers are taken from society. I personally believe that will be the final demise of America. Because America, with about 330 million or so in its population, conservative numbers, and you'll never hear this on the press, they always try to minimize it, but accurate conservative numbers place born-again Christians in America somewhere conservatively between 60 and 90 million people. That's why politicians always go out of their way to steal your vote. We are a power to be reckoned with. And most churches and most believers have no full biblical, let alone prophetic knowledge that we are the restraining power. The power of believers. The authority of followers of Christ. Not that we place that authority upon self-serving accolade but knowing that we are the army of the living God and that our prayers have power. The Bible said the prayers of the righteous have mighty power. The prayers of the righteous have stopped the planet from spinning. The prayers of the righteous have stopped the rain from falling. The prayers of the righteous have raised the dead. The prayers of the righteous have healed the sick. The prayers of the righteous have changed the course of nations. The prayers of the righteous have changed the hearts of luminaries and world leaders. There is power in prayer in these last days to do the work and the will of God with power and never panic. For we will soon rule and reign with him forever and forever. Come on and somebody shout a hallelujah like you believe it.
Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I, the Bible said we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the earth. Salt protects and preserves. Our presence in this world is protecting and preserving against the ultimate wrath of God that will soon be unleashed upon ungodliness being stored up for the wrath of the tribulation. And we are the light And light always prevails and dominates darkness. Where there is light, there can be no darkness whatsoever. Hear me loud and clear. The restraining prophetic power in the world today is the spirit-filled church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the moment we are raptured, imagine 60 to 90 million people being taken out of America. And quite frankly, we're the best. Not all, but on average. We are capitalists by doctrine. We show up for work. We take responsibility. I'm talking to those of you that are real Christians, not to those of you who pretend you are on Sunday. We are the power that drives this nation. We are the leaders. We are the executives. We are the presidents. We are the CEOs. We are the innovative. We are the entrepreneurial. We are the never quitters. We are the fighters. We are the get back up and give it another shot. We are the ones who decide by the power of prayer, I cannot fail because the power of heaven backs me in all I do. And when the spirit-filled church is taken in the twinkling of an eye out of this nation, This nation will go into utter chaos in minutes, not days. The economy will collapse simply by the financial numbers of Christians not going to work and not paying their bills. Now, some of you already have gotten to practice for the rapture. (laughs) But imagine all 60 to 90 million Christians not paying their bills not being involved in the economy, not doing their work. Just through logistics alone, America collapses within days of the rapture. You know, nations like Turkey probably won't even know the rapture took place until they see it on the news. Forty-plus million people in Turkey, just a handful of Christians there. Nations like Turkey and godless nations will be almost unaffected initially. But nations like America, it'll literally, by cutting the heart out of the nation, and America will take two steps and drop. And our enemies will immediately carry out their promises to wipe Westerners from the face of the earth. And you have to remember that the Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. America is the only nation in human civilization that has sowed nuclear bombs. And many prophetic voices through the years have said, because America has sown nuclear bombs, America must reap nuclear bombs. I'm not preaching that dogmatically. I'm just saying that when the church is gone from America, if you think we're weak and corrupt and dysfunctional now, You cannot even begin to imagine the horror of what will come upon America the moment the rapture takes place. The rapture of the church will provide the instantaneous removal of all restraint against evil and wickedness in this world. 
musicians, would you come? One scholar wrote these words, quote, the rapture will change everything. When the rapture occurs, the spirit indwelt church and its restraining influence will be removed. That will release the world to sin as it never has been before. Christians who stand for civic righteousness and law and order will no longer be present exerting their influence. The church's salt and light will be extracted from the earth for a time at least only unsaved, godless people will hold government office. Satan will be able to put his plan into full swing by bringing his men onto the center stage to take full control of the world. Evil will erupt and expand unchecked beyond anything known in the history of man. It will be like the removal of a huge dam. The world will be inundated with evil of unimaginable scope and severity. End of quote. But if you're a true Christian, how many this morning have faith in Christ and are living for him and him alone? If you are a true Christian and living in right relationship with God, let me leave you with encouraging news because Paul said concerning Bible prophecy, comfort one another with these words. The real message of Bible prophecy, you heard me say it a hundred or a thousand times or more, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. But if you're a true Christian, you'll never meet the Antichrist. If you're a true Christian, you will never see the mark of the beast. If you are a true Christian, you will never be under the control of a one world government. If you are a true Christian, you will never be here to face Armageddon and Israel's greatest war and potentially international world wars. If you are a true Christian, you will never go through a single hour of the tribulation period. How can I be sure of that? Because Jesus himself said so. In Revelation 3, verses 10 and 11, Jesus said to the church, because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. No believer will see the unprecedented wrath of God that will be unleashed upon this world immediately after the rapture takes place. I said it as I began. I say it as I close. Are you living ready to meet the Lord? Not do you hope so, not do you think so. Do you know so? Do you lay your head to the pillow at the end of every day, regardless of how the day went, having an assurance in your heart, it is well with my soul. But there are too many Christians that say, I'm a Christian, but you never read your Bible. You never pray. And I'm not condemning you. I'm asking you to do a self-examination. Do you attend a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor every Sunday? It's one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Every Sunday morning, God looks down and sees those who are truly committed to Him. Are you praying for your unsafe family? Are you praying for your unsafe friends? Have you led anybody to Christ? I want you to be ready to meet the Lord. And I've given you enough insight from Bible prophecy for you to understand what potentially what's going on in Israel could be. It has potential of unfolding into scenarios perhaps indeed covered by Scripture. But we don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We do know that the great war against Israel is after the rapture. And so I'm challenging you today. Yes, pray for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But most importantly, pray for yourself. Pray that you'll be ready. 
pray that you'll not be deceived by sin and sinful relationships, bad choices and bad company. Pray that you'll live ready every day to meet the Lord. And if you don't have that peace, I want to pray with you before we're dismissed. Would you stand to your feet across the sanctuary? What you're about to do is the most important decision in life. If you're anywhere else in the world, I want you to go to lostlamb.org, L-O-S-T-L-A-M-B, one word, lostlamb.org, and click on New Beginnings and follow the easy prompts and write me an email, and I read every testimony that comes in for salvation. You matter to God. Let's pray together. Wherever you're at, just we're talking to God. Say, Heavenly Father, Today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I want to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Today I recognize my sin. There is nothing in my life hidden from your eyes. And I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin. And I turn my heart to Jesus Christ. I trust in the cross. And the blood that was shed cleanse me today and make me holy in your eyes. Purify my mind, my body and spirit. For I receive salvation as the gift of God, not by my works, but by your great mercy. And according to the promise of God, all who call upon your name shall be saved. My sins are forgiven, and I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. Today I'm saved. Today I'm healed. Today I'm delivered. Today I'm blessed. I am no longer under the curse of sin. I am today in covenant with God. And I vow I will live for you all the days of my life. In place of my weakness, give me your strength. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me that power to be what you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe and receive the word of the Lord today, give Jesus Christ a mighty hand of praise.